Teresa asked a great question, and uh, this is one I know we're going to have a, a heartfelt discussion around. What should organizations do to prepare for the new version of Outlook? Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I, I, yes, have Karen, yes. I have thoughts on this. I have thoughts on this. So in Outlook, if you go to file and go down to the bottom, there's a thing that says feedback. And if you click the feedback <laughs> button, then you can send a frowny face mm -hmm, or you could mm -hmm. suggest a feature. And in either of those locations, you could type about how you feel about preparing about the new version of Outlook. That's my feedback. Yes. And it starts with the frowny face? Is that the, is that the, is, is that, that, that the, is that the default option is the frowny face de default? <laughs> uh, look, okay, so my my opinion on this and having worked with the end users on it, um, if it is in the consumer space, the simplification of Outlook, where it looks a lot like um, a, a little bit more of a ramped up mail, that you know, the mail app that you would actually have on a consumer side of things. So it's kind of ramped up a little from the mail app. And that app that's sort of very similar to the online version, we saw that sort of marrying up of, you know, trying to bring the two together. So you had one app, one world. And look, Microsoft did this with OneNote. They created the app for OneNote, but then they didn't yeah, get rid of the did. old version. And the enterprise side of things absolutely <clears throat> lost their nana. And eventually, of course, now what's happening, the two are becoming one. And they're maintaining the, the more advanced versions of OneNote. And that was back in 2018. And, and the MVPs back then had a real conniption around it. Now, they're going the same way on the Outlook side of things, where it's simplifying down. And inside enterprise, the features that I'm actually seeing utilised are just not there. In, and so many them and just not there in the new mail, you know, Outlook app. So I'm seeing the likes of executive assistants who need some of those more advanced functionality and it's just not there for them. Um, and I know I've tried and I'm working on stuff and I can't even teach some of the things that that I used to be able to teach that are functionality that are needed for more advanced mail work um, that is just not there. I have actually had to turn it off. And you know what's the first time ever that I have said that, that I've had to revert back to an old version. I have never done that on any of the technology, but it's become a nightmare for me to be able to help enterprise. So personally, I am not a lover, which is a sad <laughs> so we're say. saying to prepare that people need to look at the new Outlook first and decide. Yes. But don't get rid of your Outlook. Don't jump ship. Make sure you trial it out first. Make sure it fits your time. needs. I try the nice thing about that is, at least for the most time being, <clears throat> you can run both clients at the same time. Yes. Uh, you yeah. throw the switch in the desktop version, get the new one to come down, go back into your desktop and turn the switch back off. Then both clients are there. You can A, B them. You can play with mm -hmm. whatever features are available, and you will you will find many, many, many features that the desktop client has that the that the new Outlook Pre does not. It just, they're just not there yet. Yeah. And many of them are just absolutely business, business critical. There's no calm objects, no offline files, no PSD files. They're just no custom fonts. No, oh, the list is in, uh, it, it goes and on likes. and on and on and on. And Same it likes. makes a great thing for me being in the, uh, in the answers forum. Hey, it isn't doing this. And all I have to say is, no, it doesn't do that yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and the thing of it is there are, I have, I have a, <laughs> in your, in, in the, in the magic column, uh, Christian, I put a couple of links to, there are two pages that Microsoft maintains that pretty much um, they um, update with the new features and the new uh, things that they've added uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, so people basically just need to look at those two pages uh, to see whether or not the feature that they want that is missing has been addressed yet. Yeah. Well, there's, it's, I, I was it's gonna, by I was no means ready there, for prime time yet. There there are some uh, blog posts that are out there. There's, I like I pulled one up. Uh, so uh, uh, Rudy Menz, who's the, uh, his, his site, uh, the Lazy Admin, uh, he has a comparison, uh, what you need to know, and kind of goes through each of the features and compares them. Uh, so there, there is some guidance out there if you're wondering. Like I made the comment before we started, uh, like how um, about a year and a half, two years ago, so I had problems. I had a 
uh, I had a hacker incident uh, and it, something got derailed and got screwed up in my account. And I, the desktop version just stopped working. And in fact, Hal and I tried to figure out going through problems. And I, I had just started using uh, the, the browser version, uh, created a PWA, just have it pinned to the desktop. And I was frustrated that there were uh, several features that were missing from that experience. I don't remember what my complaints were. I, I've now it's, I've been using it for so long. I'm happy with it. It does ev just about everything that I need it to do. Uh, and so it was, it was tough for a couple months. But honestly, now here, a year and a half, two years later, I don't remember what those things were that I felt were missing uh, because I'm able to get everything done. Um, so, you know, part of it is, and I jokingly say, you know, before we were recording, like, oh, just lower your expectations, you know. Uh, come on. There's so much that you can accomplish, accomplish in the world if you just lower your expectations. I can do anything. I can <laughs> run and win, win a race against five-year-olds but i can win a race Indeed. running around you know well we would have we would have uh, stick with the one note app if we'd lowered our expectations uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, and that's kind of what i'm hoping for personally is that they they come to their senses and, and realize that the, i mean you, you just well they perhaps can replace all the functionality in the desktop client with a web client, but they certainly are not going to do it in the time frame that they're suggesting a year or two. It's right. going to be considerably and longer too many, than that. Too many business critical features and functionality, exactly. even just something like a template. Templates that get used by an awful lot by, you know, executives, uh, assistants and things like that. Taking away those sorts of functionality means you're not going to get them off the desktop client. They will hold on that to dear life until the the new version and potentially has some of those core features. Can I ask? Is I don't know if, if anybody knows, but but what was the behind this complete rebuild and removing all the features? Like but what's what's going on? Is it just a complete re-architecture? Is that why? Are they just changing it fundamentally and so that they're having to recreate the entire product? I mean, if you think about modern technology in general, so when they started to redo SharePoint for SharePoint Online, this is one of the things I talked about for a while, is that with the modern architecture and we think about cloud first and we think about any mobile device and, you know, any product, any platform, any 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 solution, right? So, like, I want to be able to connect to anything in the cloud and I don't want to have to limit it to ha a specific device. You have to eliminate all downloadable, all executables if you want to achieve that goal. So, from an architecture perspective, I'm not going to speak for Microsoft specifically, but from an architecture perspective for a cloud first world, for a modern first world, um, you have to eliminate anything that you would actually have as a downloadable, which means that you would have to have everything be app generated with all of the data living in the cloud. So that's the thing I'm thinking of when they do things like this is that it's on a path to get us to where basically you don't have to download anything anymore and everything is stored in the cloud. There needs to and be when you look cloud at then. Yeah, that's and, one and of the bigger problems at, um, right now. Be, go, um, you go ahead. No, Christine. sorry, how you keep? Oh, that was just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that connectivity with all the new, with the AI, you know, with Copilot and all that other stuff and how it all connects and potentially that bringing it into mail, into Teams and as an app and how it all, you know, that move over to, as you said, the latest tech. They're the sorts of things that you kind of go, I understand it, but when it comes to the business critical list, they don't, they're not going to take on a lot of those sorts of things when they're quite secure gov environments, they're not going to go that way anyway. So yeah, what does it look like? And then my point was data, data maintenance. And that's the problem. You, you've got a cloud, it's a fixed size. Um, just a personal thing here. I've got the uh, off of the Office 365 family subscription, which means uh, I get, uh, I get, uh, a, oh, what? I think it's the better part of a terabyte of data, but I only get a 50 gig mailbox. And those who get, who, who are in the E3 and E5 worlds, they only get a 100 gig mailbox. And that, uh, I subscribe to a good many of the uh, MVP distribution lists. I keep all of that. I keep all of that data. It goes back years. Why? 
because people don't immediately upgrade to new stuff. They, a lot of people got really old stuff that yeah. they got. If they ain't broke, why do I need to fix it or replace it? I have got data that will help them fix it if, it, if there's a problem. That data no longer exists in Microsoft's mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So I need some means of, data, of, of keeping that data offline. That's a PSD file. You can also there's no also, such a thing in in the world that you're describing, Sharon. That doesn't exist. Well, mm -hmm. so so then we start thinking about different options, and this is where I do train some of my users that if they don't want to do PST files, you can actually send your emails directly to OneNote, and then you can save them in OneNote as an email architecture, and you can actually resend that email out as an email. So if you didn't know that, like that is a way to archive your emails in a functional way where you can still use them and respond to them and send them back out if you need to, but get them out of your inbox so that you can reduce clutter. So I think when you think about the modern architecture, there are new ways of doing things so hopefully even though maybe you're not you don't have the features that you used to have you can do it in a different way in the modern architecture um, it's just a matter of knowing how to do some of those things well and then they that, that being the case then they need to publicize that a good deal more because uh <clears throat> yeah somebody's write a blog a on whole that. lot of <laughs> friends if, if they don't and, and I mean, and that goes back to part of what, what, what Jonathan was saying, too. I mean, if the stuff has got to be discoverable, you know, I mean, you don't know how long it's somebody may want to have a legal thing that they want to. And if it's got to be discoverable and available. So. Yeah. There you have it. You got to put it somewhere. And you do have to keep it. Yes, well, you know, and I, I don't disagree with you there, Hal. I mean, I'm working with a client that's, you know, their Office 2016, they still got even versions of Office right back to 1997 mm -hmm. for their, some of their old tech. They're still on Skype, um, not off. And they're they're slowly moving off, and it's um, and starting with just minimal viable product on Teams, which is just purely calling, call me, chat sort of thing. So, um, you know, the maintaining of information they still got on premise SharePoint and multiple on premise SharePoints of old. Uh, so their migration path for their you know twenty two thousand employees is it's going to be painful. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you look at all of that and, uh, you know, keeping that information, hell, and the PSTs and the, the, that go back forever um, are going to be a challenge in some of the new world. Well, this kind of goes back to the core question that Teresa posted, which is what, what should organizations do to prepare for this change? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one is how this, as you identified, I mean, figure out your storage path for that mm. historic data. Mm. Maybe have some better knowledge management uh, processes in place than storing all of your past information in email inboxes too. When we think about collaboration and we think about content, we think about you know tacit knowledge and things like that. And you know, are there better ways to take that information and get it into a group a uh, place where you can search that information where it's not maybe living in a mailbox. But I do, yeah, I do think it's, you know, looking at the new tool and seeing if there's tool, if there's features that are missing that maybe you use on a regular day basis, look and see if there's a way to get around that in a different way um, so that when you get to the other side, you don't feel like you're missing it so much. And do an impact risk assessment on features that mm -hmm. are just, you know, what are the things that are the difference between the two applications? Um, and it depends on the organisation. If it was one person, you know, who was just at home, you're probably not going to miss it. But if you're a large organisation, then I would actually go, what is it feature parity and what does that look like? What is the loss? And then go out to the business and, and then do some workshopping and look at, you know, what's that impact on the business and what's the risk around it if you do lose that and what are alternatives around it? Because there might be an alternative that you might be able to do, use or plugins or don't, don't know what that looks like moving forward, but that's going to be a really important part of that change process. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of people really upset across potentially across your organisation if you haven't prepared them for what it looks like. And, and in all seriousness, for all Microsoft applications, there's a feedback component in every Microsoft application, and often people don't realize it's there. And, and I, I mean, we, we kind of joke about this, but on all honesty, 
respond to that feedback, like click on the feedback and tell people what you're missing, what you want, because the product teams really do see that and they use that to build their backlog so that they know what to make next. Um, and then also you can always go to feedbackportal.microsoft.com and go to the individual application and participate in um, the conversations, kind of like how I was mentioning, um, you know, you can go to tech community or you can go to feedback portal and um, post that information. And it really does help because then they know what that business critical feature is so that they can prioritize it well put yeah